Hello. Welcome to my live stream. My name is Suzanne Bryan, and this is live on July 10th, 2021 from Bakersfield, California. And it's only, I always give the weather, you know, today, right now, it's only 106 degrees today. It's supposed to be 111 by this afternoon, Fahrenheit. So it's good to see you all here. Let's see who's here. And I have more special guests today too. So you're expecting that, but they're here and we'll see them in a minute. So let's see, we have 37 Vega Lira from California, Catherine Somerville from rainy Florida. Wow, we need the rain here. Sue McVicker from Pennsylvania, Suzanne Berry from Annapolis. Welcome, Suzanne. Pam Zumwalt from sunny Oregon, Vera Hunt from very hot Idaho. She says her backyard's measuring 113 degrees. That's really hot for Idaho. Linda Annabal from British Columbia. Amy Hazuga from New York City. Elizabeth Nielsen from Sweden. Um, Suzanne Day from Washington State. Sherry Mason from Saskatchewan. Sherry, you're new. Thanks for joining us. Dora Gibson from Oklahoma. Maria Tobita from New York City. Lizanne from Benicia. Missy1328 from 208 from Central New York, Jackie Rickles from Bakersfield, Rona Shane from Southern California, Kelly Mycat from New Hampshire, and a bunch more people. Yay, welcome. We're going to have fun today. So what we've been doing the last few weeks is we've been discussing not only the ITAG SIS, which stands for It Takes a Guild, that's the ITAG, and SIS is Set in Sleeve, tutorial. We're still working on that, but we've also been doing a knit along with Frank Jernigan, Jernigan from his franco.com website. So we're working on two different sweaters. I have um, Frank here and two other people who are going to share their sweaters. So let's go to um, sharing the screen now. So here are my guests. Whoops. Welcome. So on the top left, that's Francoise. She's from Lyon, France. The bottom left is Fatima Han, De Han from Portugal. And then there's Frank. He's in the bottom right. So we'll just stay the four of us like this. We're going to talk about our experiences with knitting these sweaters. But for, first, Frank wants to tell you something. He's made a little modification that I think might help a few people. Frank, you want to talk about that? The uh, which modification inches, are you referring inches, to? The square inches. Oh, oh, I haven't made it yet. It's going to happen later today or early tomorrow. I'm going to add the number of square inches of your sweater pattern, um, including a five by five inch swatch to the uh, estimate for the yardage. Um, so if you are doing something different, or if the program doesn't give you the yardage, um, you'll at least have the number of square inches that you have to work with. And Suzanne can tell you what you can do with that. Yes. Yeah, so once you have, let, let's say you knit a swatch that's four by four inches or six by six, whatever your swatch is of the fabric that you're gonna use for your sweater. And if you're knitting the sweater in the round, the swatch should be in the round. If you're knitting the sweater flat, the swatch should be knit flat. And um, then you block it and weigh it after it's completely dry, no moisture in it, weigh it, see how many grams it is and measure it. So you can see on your yarn label how many grams, how many meters or yards there are per 100 grams or 50 grams. So let's say you're getting 100 yards for 100 grams. So that's one yard per gram. So if you know how many grams your swatch weighs and then you measure it and figure out how many square inches it is, you can figure out how many grams of yarn it takes per square inch. Then if you know how many square inches are included in your schematic for your sweater, which Frank's going to give you, all you have to do is m multiply the grams per square inch times the square inches in your sweater and it tells you exactly how much yarn your sweater is going to take. Now I always give myself an extra hundred grams. 
So let's say it says that you need 700 grams. I would have 800 grams because I like to swatch if I'm putting in any special details or buttonholes, button bands, things like that. I like to swatch for those and that does take extra yarn. It also gives you a little comfort zone of not feeling like you're running out of yarn or playing yarn chicken. And, and that's how I calculate the yarn for my sweaters. So and let's I notice when I when I pre present the yardage or, or or the number of skeins in the pattern, I say estimated. That's because I am really just guessing at how many yards per square inch you're using. And if your gauge is out too far outside the what I consider a normal range for stockinette, um, I simply say I can't calculate the estimate. So, but it's only an estimate, but what Suzanne just described was you, you'll get a much more accurate estimate that way than my guessing what you're doing. And let me, let me show you something. I'm going to go to my hands and you guys won't see this, but everybody else was, let me show you something. So let's say that you have, um, let me get my camera better here. Let's say that you have your sweater. Okay. Your schematic. And that you're going to have a, a cable pad, a big cable pattern. Let's say you're going to have a cable come down here and same thing over here. And then the rest of this is going to be reverse stockinette or seed stitch or some other background stitch. Well, you know that cables take a lot more yarn than the background stitch. So what I do in this situation, I do a swatch of my cable and weigh it and measure it and a swatch of my background stitch. So then I have two different samples. I have the cable and I have the background stitch and I know how many square inches and how many grams each of those swatches are. Then I can, I can exactly say how much of the sweater is going to be the cable so let's say that this looks like one, two, three, four, five. So 40% of this is going to be cable and 60% is going to be background stitch. So then I use 40% of this and 60% of this, and that gives me the exact yardage for my sweater. And, and so that's why I swatch, you know, that's, it takes swatching to do that. So we're going to share our work today. So let's start out with Francois. She has two projects she's working on and we're going to feature her and she can talk about her sweaters that she's working on. Yes. Hello everybody. So I am working on my eye taxis. I just finished uh, the back and the front. And um, I just made uh, the shoulder seams today. Wow. <laughs> um, I did the back in a stockinette stitch, just in stockinette stitch. And I, I made um, uh, waist shaping, like you see there. Yes, yes. Uh... Yes, yes yep. waist shaping. And uh, for the front, I chose uh, traveling stitches. Uh, and um, so I didn't uh, uh, make the waist shaping uh, in the pattern. So I did the waist shaping on the edges, um, on the edges. Yeah. Nice. And I planned uh, my design to have just um, a vertical, a vertical um, panel that uh, came just in the middle of the shoulder. Yes, as you see, so um, you can see there are two, yes. two yeah. vertical buttons on the shoulders. That's beautiful, really nicely and, centered. That's gorgeous. And I, I made like you, like Suzanne plan, uh, said. Oh yeah, yes. my favorite part. That's beautiful. <laughs> Beautiful. So I have to make the sleeves now. <laughs> yeah, exciting, exciting. Mm -hmm. So tell us about the a sweater that you're um, 
just starting for Franco. Hello, I I uh, want to um, I would like to do an over uh, all over Fair Isle sweater. So I have to choose to choose to choose. Sorry, I have to choose uh, the colors, and uh, I I take I do this uh, picture that I uh, it has colors that I like, and um, I will uh, I have taken colors in that pictures and I have bought um, some yarns to to match to match with the colors in the in this picture. So nice. and uh, so I I I tried to make um, a swatch uh, with these colors that uh, as uh, Janine Bages said in his um, in her book, uh, The Joy of Color. She said to, uh, she explains that uh, you have to, to do a swatch, a speed swatch to see how the colors uh, go together. So I will try to, to make, um, to choose a pattern now to, to put these colors, but I think I, I will change a bit <laughs> some of these colors because I don't like uh, how they come together. Yes. And uh, I, I, um, I try to, to make um, some, uh, the choice of the two sequence of colors to, to the background, for the background and for the pattern. Mm -hmm. So now I have to... Yeah, I like yes. my colors. I like your colors. I think that if you just used a pop of the red instead of as much as you used, that you might like it better. Mm -hmm. But uh, the, the colors I choose, I uh, bought is uh, well, well, more more green, uh -huh. more green. And now I will try with some blue. I like. Yeah. Yeah. I will see. I will see. <laughs> you know, this is the funnest part of creating the sweater, really, is picking the colors and seeing how they go together and the planning. Because once you start knitting, it'll go really fast. Well, it'll go faster. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. So people, you're getting a lot of positive thoughts. People think everything's really beautiful. Really enjoy Thank you. your presence. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, let's see um, what Fatima's up to, okay? This is Fatima. She's from Portugal. Hello, everybody. Uh, so I'm going on with my Frank sweater. Uh, this Frank sweater uh, is a saddle shoulder. And I decided to uh, use a lace pattern um, from Stitchinario. And um, uh, I create exactly with the number of stitches that the pattern uh, says. The number is 13 stitches, I think, Frank. And then um, I, uh, I did something differently. Instead to cast on uh, and to pick up along, uh, instead to cast on later uh, along, I made a provisional uh, cast on, crochet uh, cast on, and then I pick up stitches in order to create a different border inside. Uh, don't need to pick up later in already the edge that was completely decided. This is cotton and, uh, and bamboo. And because this will be a short sleeve, like you see here, uh, this is already the lace point and will be not stretchy. So I thought that this um, uh, lace uh, collar here would not be very stretchy. And then um, I made a small picot in a different color. Um, and with the line, because I made this um, uh, a picot, uh, uh, cast on and then I joined together uh, in a kitchenette stitch and will be the same on the edge uh, here on the lace at the end of the lace here and later when I go down 
uh, that is halfway more or less. Also, we'll be uh, after the lace. I will made also a small detail in the same color in order to give a little bit of color in this kind of uh, pastel, canal, or whatever <laughs> it is. Um, I don't like so much to knit in uh, in uh, cotton, but I for summer I think it's quite nice, and I found this. Um, this design in um, Frank, uh, the, the, sh the shoulder, the saddle shoulder, uh, very interesting. Uh, I have another one already in the middles, <laughs> but I decided to um, just to, to, to try to finish this to see how it is, because uh, when we need as much, we need more patterns, we become more confident with each one. This is my second uh, pattern from Frank, and uh, I'm fan of Frank and fan of the projects of him. And uh, I will go to do more. I think I will keep winter to do, to do Frank sweaters. Um, <laughs> the next one will be um, the same style, but I will make a cardigan and open it on the side. So it's so beautiful, so beautiful. <laughs> I what, hope next what, time I can wear that. <laughs> what size needle are you using for it? Excuse me? What size needle, knitting needle, are you using? Uh, it's an, uh, six, uh, US 6, 4 uh, millimeters. Oh, cool. And, and this cotton would be eventually for 6 um, millimeters. Uh, but I didn't want to do, but I, otherwise it would be very, very droppy. So I, I gave a little bit um, sure. more strength. Yeah. 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 And uh, yeah. Yay. Okay. So one of the things I'm, I'm going to go to my hands and talk about one of the things that she talked about that was very interesting. She said that she did it for the neck. She did a crochet cast on. So what she did is she put, she did a provisional cast on all the way around the neck and probably with even more stitches than she actually needed for the neck. And then she did um, her saddles connected to that on both sides. And then as you worked around and, and in Frank's, you, you add some stitches here and add some stitches here, and then you cast on some stitches here. Instead of casting on, she continued picking up from that crocheted from her provisional cast on that was already there. And then she worked the front and every time it said to cast on one stitch or cast on two stitches, she would move over on that crocheted provisional cast on a little bit further each time using those already cast on stitches until she did the main cast on for the front of the neck when she still used those. And in this event, you want to have more provisional cast on stitches than you're going to use just for a safety factor. They're just left over. They're just left over. And when you take them out, this is still all connected in a circle. Then she worked her Pico edge separately and then connected them together. She joined them together. Did you use like a Kitchener stitch? Kitchener stitch. Or she could have just picked up the other edge of the provisional cast on. Well, she wouldn't have the other edge. You would have to pick up. Yep. Yep. She has to pick up. So that's how she did that. That's a very, very interesting thing. I really like that. So thank you, Fatima. And I use also a provisional cast on. Um, also for and that I go to do here for the sleeve. Yeah. The Yes. Yes. Yeah, I like that. I like that idea. I'm going to use that for future sweaters too, myself. So um, thank you. Let me remove your spotlight. Let's see. You know, I have to learn all these things. Okay, so I'm going to let Francoise and Fatima go. They can stay on here if they want, but Frank and I are going to talk now. So um, I'm going to spotlight me and Frank. You know, a year ago, I had no idea how to do any of this. So here we are. So um, let me show you what I'm doing on mine. So here is mine. 
I've gotten a little bit further than I was last time. And I haven't worked on the sleeves anymore. I've just been working on the body because I'm also working on my eye tag cyst. So I switch back and forth. Once you get past the uh, shoulders and, and separating off for the arms, this is pretty much mindless knitting. So I do this, I work on this sweater when I'm doing my mindless knitting. And then I work on this sweater, which is my eye tag cyst, which I'll show you more in a minute when I have to concentrate, when I feel like I can concentrate. So I kind of switch back and forth. But I'm at a decision point on here right now, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about what Francoise was talking about, the waist shaping. So I'm going to go to my hands and show you different options for waist shaping, okay? Back to my pencil and paper. So let's get a clean sheet out here. So there's different options for waist shaping. Let's talk about what Fatima, you know, what Francoise is doing in her eye tag cyst. So we'll start over here. This is her front. And below that, we'll put the back. So on her front, she has an intricate design down here, and then in the front here, and then also here. So if you were gonna do any waist shaping in the front, you would interrupt her stitch pattern. It would cause this to move in towards this, and she doesn't want that. So on the front, she chose to add her waist shaping on the edges. like this, but on the back, she chose to put them in here. So let's say that you're a woman with a very large bust and that your bust comes down into this area here, which would be your waist. Putting waist shaping either in the front, even if you didn't have a stitch pattern, is almost impossible because it would interfere with any bust shaping that you're putting in. They would overlap and not work. So in that case, again, you could put them on the sides, or even if you're, if you're really busty and it extends to your sides, you could put them in the back, just like this. And you can even put more in the back. You can move, usually the waist shaping is divided into four segments. So you can either do two segments, one on either side of the exact side, or as Francoise did, she did two segments on one on each side and one in the back, or you could put all four in the back. So if you looked at this garment from the side, this is the shoulder and this is the underarm. If you were gonna make them on the edge, you would make your decreases right on either side of the side seam. But in this case, the side seam is straight. There's no increases or decreases on either side of the side seam. They're moved into the fabric. Now, of course, you would want to mirror these. For example, if you're working the bottom up, these would be decreases until you got to the waist. And usually at the waist, you work about an inch without any shaping. So these would be decreases here. And these would be increases up here. But usually you want to mirror them. For example, if you used a knit two together here, you would use an SSK over here. Or vice versa. You can do it either way. You could use an SSK here and a knit two together here, and they give a different look. And that's something that I would swatch first to see which one you like. If you're working them on the side, again, you mirror them, and you would do also swatch whether you're gonna do uh, SSK, knit two together, or knit two together, SSK. So let me, get a, let me get a couple swatches out. Let me show you something. It just now occurred to me to show this. I'm getting it out of my binder. So here are some samples.
this one, if this were a side seam, let me focus this better. There we go. If this were your side seam and you used SSK on this side and knit two together on this side, this is what it would look like. This is working until one, till the right before the side seam stitch. You would have two stitches remain here before the side seam stitch and you would do an SSK. Then the side seam stitch and then knit two together. Or you could have two stitches in the side seam. It doesn't matter, or three or four. It's your personal preference. You can do whatever you want at your knitting. This is the exact same directions. Let me zoom in a little bit. Exact same directions. But this is using a knit two together on this side and an SSK on this side. So on this swatch, you knit until two stitches before the center stitch, same as this, and you work a knit two together. Then you do the center stitch, then an SSK. Do you see the difference in how that looks? So it's personal preference whether you want this to be on the side of your sweater or this. Even in... Um, Let's look at a couple more swatches. Let me get a couple more out to talk about the, um, and the same is true for the increases above. Once you get above the um, waist and you would be doing increases, it's the same thing. You want to mirror them. But let's look at what your swatches would look like in the body of your sweater. So here, let's say this was in the body of your sweater. I'm talking about this situation here. You could have these on one side of the body and these on the other. This would be called blended. Or you could have these on one side and these on the other. Of course, they wouldn't be this close together. These are every other row, because if you're going to do shaping here, it's you're going to do one every inch or so, you know, or one every half inch. They wouldn't be this close together. But the difference is in the effect that you get in the line that you create for your waist shaping. And the same holds true for increases. So it's personal preference. And these are the things that I swatch in advance. Um, so that's about waist shaping. Let me show you what, oh, let me go back to my hands. I'll show you what I'm gonna do on mine. So on my Franco sweater, here's my Franco sweater. And I've got my lace coming down the sleeves just like Fatima has. What I want on mine, his pattern does not give you any sort of shaping below the armholes. So what I want, I want more of an A shape. I want mine to come out like this, starting about four inches below. I'm starting about four inches below the underarms. I'm starting shaping this way. Now I don't want my fabric to just be going straight out like this. So what I'm doing is I'm putting the shaping in here on the front and back. So I'm adding increases. And what I've done, I'll show you on my sweater to facilitate that. I figured out that I want, here's my sweater. Find the side, here's my stitch markers. So here's one side. And up from one side, here's the underarm, here's the other underarm. From one side to the other, I have 120 stitches. So the whole circumference of my sweater is 240 stitches. So I divide that 120 into fourths, which is 30. So I put a marker 30 stitches in from the edge here, and a marker, a different marker, 30 stitches in from the edge here, and there's 60 in the middle. So there's half of the width here, a fourth, and a fourth. And this is where my increases are going to come down like this. And the reason I use different stitch markers is to remind me whether I'm doing um, 
when I'm doing my mirrored increases, I'm going to use I'm going to use make ones. Those are my favorite increases. Everybody has their personal preference, but I'm going to make a make one right and a make one left. So by having a different colored marker on each side, I know whether I need to make the right or the left. And I'm, I'll write it down on my on my pattern worksheet. I'll put that the silver bulb pin is make one right and the dangly marker is make one left. So if I forget, which you know how that goes, I always say, oh, I'll remember that I bound off 11 stitches for when I do the other side. And then I don't remember, I have to go back and, and figure it out. So I write these things down. So that's how I'm going to work mine. Mine's gonna be more of an A shape. I'm actually going to add six inches to the hips from the underarm. So I'm gonna add an inch and a half of increases here and an inch and a half of increases here and the same on the other side. So that's what I'm doing with that. So let me... Um, would you like to, um, maybe I should add a comment. Um, someone asked me, in a forum once what the most invisible form of increase was for body shaping and my first reaction was to say use the lifted increase if you really want it to be invisible and then i did more research and i came across an increase i had never seen before in uh, june Himmons hyatt's uh, principle of knitting on page 210 she describes the raised the the slip raised increase, which is which I also call the slip lifted increase. Uh -huh. And um, I did a a video taking after your lead on how you do experiments and then compare yeah. them and show the results. Yeah. I did that. I did. I created uh, several swatches and then showed the results. And um, I truly believe the slip lifted increase turned out to win, and in my I'll opinion. Have to try that. Well, what page yeah. is it on? It's on page two ten. Two ten. And I have a video. I'll put a link to the video in the chat. Is that a good idea? Well, they won't see the chat because you're just no in, in YouTube yeah, in chat. YouTube, yes, you can put it in the yeah. YouTube chat. Yes, that would be great. Okay. Um, I did that, and um, uh, uh. I was going to say the the slip lifted increase is simply a lifted increase where you do not work the stitch that you lifted out of. You slip that stitch. So you lift the, the normal way, but but the stitch you right. lift from you just slip. So That's the only. Both on the needle at the same time. Um, well, in the order you do them, you know, if you're doing right. a right lifted, right. you do the. Right. the right and then you slip the next stitch on right. the left it's on the left one you slip the stitch and then lift it from the right to the right. left so you're not knitting into what you lifted you're just putting that on your needle no you do knit into what you lift you don't knit into the stitch you lift out of oh i'll have to see i'll have to look at it i'm not yeah. picturing it um so there's some comments here that i need to address already um, and, and Sherry Ma Mason has a really good one, and I'm going to go back to my hands. Uh, she says, could you use ribbing for shaping? Yes. So let's say that you have your, uh, that's a great question, Sherry. So here's our garment. And this could be the front or the back. If you could, put, you could put some ribbing from here to here on the side. on both sides that would pull it in um also let's say that it was the um, um back of the garment you could put a cable in here or two or three cables just in the back at the waist it would pull it in and it would pull around from the front you wouldn't necessarily want cables on the front of your garment but i think it would look really cool on the back and because of you know cable flare compensation, the cable really pulls the fabric in from side to side, just as ribbing does. Just the same thing, but it would give you a cable instead of ribbing. That is a great, great question, Sherry. Thank you. Um, Angela Edwards said, I'm new to knitting and I have no idea what SSK or SD stitching is. An SSK is a decrease that takes two stitches and turns them into one. And a knit two together does the same thing. It takes two stitches and turns them into one. So you have one fewer stitches in the width of your fabric. 
and you can that's how you shape fabric like in cloth when you're sewing on it and you're cutting out fabric you cut it to shape it in knitting you can't cut it so what you do is you change the number of stitches and you change the number of stitches by working them together and you can do that an ssk stands for slip as if to knit slip as if to knit knit two together it's a, a knitting thing and i have lots of videos on all this kinds of stuff if you want to look at it um she caitlin says that she thinks ann bud shows that increase from um june Hemmons hyatt's in one of her craftsy classes too we'll have to take a look at it and see what it looks like that's interesting it's one i haven't seen um missy says in she's going to look it up but she thinks in the older version of the book the page 210 is facings in mine so she'll have you'll have to compare the older version with the newer version sorry about that sherry says she likes the cable idea i'm always trying to think of how you can incorporate some sort of little oomph into something you know bradley says for the franco sweater how far from the sides do you make the increases for the bust okay let me show you on that okay we talked a little bit about that last week but we can go over it again so again you have no it's not bust shaping there's no shaping in the pattern other than the set in sleeve um the simultaneous set in sleeves and the shoulder shaping so here you have this you i i draw schematics for myself where i know let's say that from the top of the neck to the bottom here that i like 21 inches okay that's the length i like i know that my armhole i like like seven and a half inches you know you learn your body so relatively speaking you need to measure from here down to your bust point the portion of your bust that protrudes the furthest and mark that on here so let's say that it's um eight and a half inches then you also need to measure from the side of your body directly under your arm pit right in the middle from here to the part where your bust protrudes the most also and let's say that that's six inches and each person's going to be different and then i put a spot here for the bus point now i use that for multiple things for one i do not want to have any specific design element right over that like a bobble or something that looks like a circle or a hexagon yeah you know, that just would not look good so i like to know where my bust is in relationship to what i'm going to be knitting so if you were going to put in bust shaping you would not want the very point of your bust shaping to be right here. You want it to be about an inch or two to the side over here. So your bust shaping would be at the level of the highest the point of your bust that protrudes the most over an inch or two. And then you're going to add, this is the fabric that you would be adding right here. This is the fabric that would be adding with your short row shaping. This is not added fabric. This is nothing like a gray area on a chart. There's no stitches in this area. And let me get my little, my little uh, sample that I used to show that. So this is what that's going to look like. If you cut that out, if you cut out the area where there's no stitches and you pull this together, because that's where this fabric will connect, you can see that it creates your bust shaping. Okay. Let's go back to Frank and I. So then let's see, Rona Shane says, question. I am talking vertical distance, vertical distance, horizontal vertical distance. You mean how, how long to make your bust? How much bust shaping to add? I think she's referring to her statement to, to before. What, what will be the distance between your increases? Oh, okay. Let me go back to that. 
I misinterpreted your question. Okay, so let's say that this is going to be the area that you're going to increase right here, okay? Let's say you want to add two inches of length and your, your increases are going to be in this area, right? So, and let's say that this is six inches across from here to here. So if you're getting uh, five stitches to the inch and seven rows, and I'm just picking numbers for one inch, you have to know your own stitch and row gauge, right? So you would know that you in two inches, you want to add 14 rows. So in here, in this part, there's going to have to be 14 new rows. Then you're going to want to distribute those 14 turns for your wrap and turns or whatever type of short rows you're going to use. You're going to want to distribute those over the six inches. So in six inches, we know that we're going to get 30 stitches, right? Because there's five stitches to the inch and we want 14 short rows. So each short row, each two short rows, each two is one turning point. So if we're adding 14 short rows, we're going to have seven turning points along here. And we have 30 stitches to place them in. So seven goes into 30. Um, 27 is a good number, right? No, it's 21, 21, four, that's four. Seven goes into 30. Now my brain shut off. <laughs> Frank, what's seven go into 30? This goes to four. Four, yes, four. So every four stitches, every four stitches, your short row turns would be four stitches apart. That would be 28, which is close to 30. That's close enough. That's how you figure that out. Does that help you, Rona? Oh, for my A-line increases. Okay, let's talk about that. So I'm doing my A-line increases. For A-line, it's up to you whether you want to start them above, in the middle of, or below your bust. I'm going to start mine four inches down from my underarm. Here's my bust in this area here. So I'm starting mine slightly below my bust. Think moo moo, okay? If you start your increases above your bust, it's going to be more like a moo moo effect. And if you like that, that's fine. It's personal preference. I want mine to be start right below my bust, but above my waist. So I'm starting at four inches down. It's just personal preference. I just, that's what, I am tall. I'm very, very tall and thin. So I don't want to have it up too high because it will give me that moo moo effect. It depends on your body shape. Okay. Okay, any other questions at this point? Okay, so now I'm going to talk about my eye tag sis sweater. So here I am on this, and I've um, started my armhole shaping. The armhole shaping on this one, the arm side, you know, the arm side is just the bottom of the arm, it's the curve. The arm side is the curve. The armhole is the whole thing up to your shoulder. So from your shoulder down to where the curve starts is just the armhole. Where the curve is, is the actual arm side. So on this one, I have my arm side done. And now I'm ready just to go straight up to my shoulder. This one, I'm still working on the arm side, but I'm doing them both together because I have a fairly intricate uh, pattern here and I have a short term memory. So, and I drew it all out. I have it all on paper. Let me go, I have to go get that. It's in the other room. Bear with me, okay? While she's gone, let me say, I've just started using the word arm sigh, and now I know I've been using it incorrectly. I thought it was the entire armhole. And so I talk about the depth of the arm sigh in some of the forum answers I've given recently. 
please ignore my use. Just, re, just <laughs> know that I'm talking about the de the entire depth of the arm hole when I talk about. I learned that when I'm doing the iTag sys. You know, when I do these iTag things, I do a ton of research. I look in every single one of my books, and I read, it, and then I do it. So this, see, I charted. This is knitter's graph paper. And it has my stitches per inch and rows per inch is exactly the same as my fabric. So I just chart, I don't, you don't need to chart the whole thing because you only need to chart the part where you're going to make the uh, decreases. See, so, and then I drew my decreases in. I drew the shape. I drew the shape of my arm side. Now what you have to worry about, let me go back to my hands on something like this. If you're doing lace or cables, and mine has lace and cables in it. So here's my, here's my arm side right here. And I put my increases and in this is my decreases, this yellow dashes here. But here, my increase coincides with a, my decrease coincides with an increase. So if I just leave that increase out, it's the same thing as making a decrease. I couldn't really make a decrease on top of a decrease. Then when you get up to um, this portion up here of my armhole shaping, my stitch pattern, here's the increase, here's the decrease that corresponds with this increase. The decrease is outside my armhole. It's no longer going to be in, involved in the fabric. So I have to turn that into just a knit. It's just not going to be there. I can't make that increase. It's gone. So I dotted it out because the corresponding decrease is over here. And if I make that increase without the corresponding decrease, my fabric will just start getting whiter and whiter and whiter right here. So I have, that's why I chart my stitch pattern for the whole arm hole. And I've marked out these increases that correspond with the decreases that are no longer part of my fabric. And I make other little changes to uh, keep the stitch pattern in sync so that it will follow up. When you're doing something like this, it's okay to fudge a couple stitches this way or a couple stitches this way to maintain a pattern. I wouldn't go more than a quarter of an inch. Now I'm getting nine and a half stitches to the inch, so two stitches isn't very much. It's a, a, a fifth of an inch. So it's not going to make much difference in how my sleeve cap is going to fit in here. So um, that's how I do that. So let's see. Empire waist. Rona saying yes, no for the A-line increases. Empire waist. Yeah, I guess that's what you're calling it. Empire waist. That's what I'm creating. But you can make your waist anywhere you want it. You can, you know, because you're knitting your own sweater. You can do it however you want. Um, any other questions or thoughts or anything that you'd like to talk about today? So, you know, Frank has his, while you're thinking of your questions, I'll keep talking. Um, Frank has his Zoom knit along directly after this at 2.30. And you can find that. Frank, you want to type your uh, into the YouTube, the address for your Zoom thing into the YouTube one? Sure, I can do that. Yes. Um, and it's really for anyone who is knitting a Franco sweater. So that would include all of you if you want to come join us. We just hang out together. It's not a teaching session, though I do answer questions if you have specific questions. But it's really just for people to knit together and work on their sweaters and share their progress. And it's, it's a community. A it's, it's a community. And there That's are people right. from all over the world there. And you will really enjoy it. And I encourage you to do that because then you'll get a better idea of Frank's sweaters and what he's doing with his website. And um, I love them. Um, I'm gonna knit one for my son next uh, using his because they're just, it's... Oh, Demetria, thank you, thank you, thank you. I have one more person to show. Oh my goodness. Let me find it. I'm gonna put me on here because I don't want to share my my texting with you. I'm sorry, Demetria. I have to show you the most amazing sweater. It's an iTag Sis. You're going to just, it'll blow you away. Okay, so I'm going to share this and then I'm going to go to her Ravelry page. Okay, so let me get this in the center. We want to close that. 
This is Demetria. Now she doesn't want you to see her face or hear her voice, but I love her. She's a dear friend of mine. And this is her iTag sis. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that gorgeous? Amazing. So now I'm going to go to her, um, I'm going to go to her Ravelry page and you, we can talk about the details of how she did that. She's bashful. So let me go find Demetria. Sorry, it takes me a second to do this. All right. She calls it vintage look. Let me share the screen. It's going to be, can you see that? Yes, you can see that. Great. Let's see. We want to go to her pictures. Let's read about her project first. She says, notes, done. I'm very happy with it. What I'm happiest about, I believe it's the fit of the sleeve and armhole. No awkward folds or pulling. Yay. I've learned a lot and love the freedom of knitting to the sloper measurements. Of course, there's no pattern to pull my share here. It was made to my specific body and taste, and a lot was done on a whim. There won't be another one just like it. Not for me. Not from me. Lessons learned. Don't change horses in the middle of the river. And by that, I mean, I waited so long to actually decide on making saddles that the princess shaping curve ended up too low and makes an unintended feature. Not ugly, I don't think, but definitely not what I had in mind. Write down everything, not just to be able to pass it on, but so that the back and the front have the same number of rows at the side seam. Sewing the back and front buttons to each other so that they can be repositioned sounds good in theory, but, it practic in, but practically it's a good way to lose buttons. <laughs> to keep researching, does it really matter which short row, the longest or the shortest, goes at the top, bottom? Toy cardigan, info not included here. So she made a small one first. And here's her gauge swatch. And she started out, um, let's see, let's start finishing armhole and sleeve cap, finding there's a fold that it was made of fabric I could make into a dart. That's not an option. So let's go down here she, where she made her sloper. So here she made her slipper. Here's the fold of this extra fabric. And in the iTag SIS, I teach you how to make a sloper. That's part of it. You make the sloper first. And so she made her sloper, tried it on. She had this extra fabric here. So then she had to figure out what was she going to do to get rid of that extra fabric. And she goes through her whole process here. And you can click on her project. It's Demetria Yui on Ravelry. But she shows her whole process of how she figured everything out. Here she made her paper pattern. She's figuring out her bust shaping. Then she's doing her swatching. And here she's fitting in. She wants to have a full sleeve up here and figuring out where the shoulder's going to come, where the sleeve's going to fit in. This is short row shaping here at the top. This is her fabric one. So she made another one. This is the yarn. This is going to be her bust shaping. Her neckline. The sleeve cap. How it's going to fit in. Then she started knitting. Isn't it beautiful? So stunning might be my favorite sweater ever. And that's her sleeve. And you see how she made the sleeve cap really wide because she really wanted a full sleeve. She planned for that. So this part needs to fit around her arm, but see how it gets wider here and here? So it's really full up here because she's going to gather it here. Here she's gathering it. Isn't it the most awesome sweater? I just love this. And I really wanted her to wear it and show you, but she doesn't feel comfortable doing that. So that's Demetria, it's in, and it's um, D-M-E, 
D-M-E-T-R-I-A-U-Y on Ravelry. Okay? So let's go back to Frank and I. So we're back. Here we are. Wasn't that beautiful? Let's see. That was incredible. All of the people who are doing your eye tag are just producing the most amazing things. Yes. It's just a, a joy to see. Mar oh, Marie Tobita asked a question on Ravelry. Thanks for reminding Marie, me, Marie. I looked the other day and I didn't look again today. I'm sorry. Whoops. I don't I want to put it on me. I'm not going to share my computer. Isn't it amazing what we can do with technology? So in the forums, Franco sweater. Let's see, Marie, did, are you answering it in the Franco sweater or in the eye tag? Frank, it's the sweaters they're posting are gorgeous. Okay, so let's, the ones in my in my group. Okay, I tag. It's this incredible Marie Marie. That's Jerry Rossiter. Questions. Here we go. Chani, when I was working the front button band, I sometimes have a problem. My problem is the elongation of the strands between the salvage stitches and the first stitches by especially redoing picking up and at the same place. Yes. The strands are further stretched, creating a ladder between the first stitches and the new stitches. How can I avoid or fix this? Let me show you. That was a great question. I understand because I've had that problem too before when I picked up, especially my teaching samples, because I seam and then I rip it out and seam again for every class. So what happens is you get this big stretched area between the selvage stitch and the first column in. Let me make this bigger. So here's the selvage column. If you're picking up stitches along here repeatedly, these little strands, the strands that you're picking up from, get stretched out. And then when you take it out, they stay stretched out. This is how you can fix that. You go to the very edge of the selvage stitch and pull it out like this and pull on it. Every single one and that will tighten those back up. Something You can't really avoid it, it's just, uh, it's, it's unavoidable. So you would just pull out on these, every one, and that will tighten that back up in there for you. So try that, Marie, okay? Okay. Um, Emily wants to know, Demetria, how you ended up doing your buttons. Did you answer? Thanks. She said, thanks all. Demetria's work, it's just unbelievable. Okay, so we're nearing the end of our presentation today. I hope to be closer to the bottom of the body of my Franco next week and have my eye tag sis knit up to the tops of the shoulders, including the neckline. So that's my goal for this coming week. And um, what's your goal? Leave me comments in the videos. When the video goes on to uh, YouTube, leave some comments. Tell us what your goals are for this week. And Frank and I will be back here again next week. Be sure to subscribe to my YouTube channel if you haven't already. And I understand if you don't have a Google account, you can't subscribe. Okay, I'll give you a pass on that, okay? But if you do have a Google account, would you please subscribe to my YouTube station uh, channel and give us a thumbs up, uh, share this video with your friends. It's okay with us if you share this information. It's not privileged or private. It's for public use. It's okay to share it. The more the merrier. Both Frank and I are here because we want to help you be a better knitter. Absolutely. Including your friends. Okay, so we're not just trying to have a narrow group of people. We would like to have as wide a group of people as we can. And so we'll see you here again um, next same time, same place next week. Okie dokie. Talk to you later. Bye-bye. Okay.